right. Well, good morning. I hope you're all doing well. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was check in with you about how the project in this class is going um, and try to be able to answer any questions that, that you have about the, the project. So I'll start with that. What kind of questions do you have about the project? Um, so I've been working on the ad instruction. Uh -huh. um, when you come out of the ALU, uh, how you have to write it back to RD, uh -huh. um, how is the best way to do that? Okay, so you've got your ALU, right? And you want it to come back out to your register file. Right. So um, the way you want to do that is your your register file should be listening to this output, right? Because whenever this output changes, if if you set up this register file as listening to this, when the output from the ALU changes, it will notify the register file, hey, I now have a 4 on my output, or I now have a 17 on my output, or, or whatever, right? And so then the ALU, because it is, uh, it inherits from a reporter, it will notify this, assuming that in here, you call update listeners at the appropriate time. That call to update listeners is what will notify the register file of an update coming in on this input. Right. So then the register file will know, well, I've got a new update. It won't change this yet, right? Because the the key thing is, this is clocked, right? So the register file will, will wait from a notification from the clock input, and that's then when it will send this value to the appropriate register that it that uh, it has. So right, there's going to be some RD that that's also connected to it. So when the clock ticks. It will take whatever the last value it saw in here um, and say that's the register I'm supposed to send this to. It will take whatever the last value it saw in here and say that's the value I'm supposed to set. And it will take this value and determine whether or not to write that value or to ignore that value. Does that make sense? And then that'll be good because then you'll see how to get this flowing through. And you'll do the same thing, right? Just you'll, you'll, you have the ALU should be listening to there, right? It should be registered to listen to the zeroth output of this and the first output of, of that. Um, and then you can start adding in components to this just like we did add in components in class as we grew out our thing. Uh, and you'll, the nice thing about that is you'll know all the connections work, you'll know that, um, <coughs> excuse me, you'll, you'll know how to make these connections and so when you add a new component and it doesn't work, you'll say, oh, well, it was this component that changed so I can isolate my debugging kind of to, to that connection rather than throwing all the components on the, in your system in all at once and say, okay, well, uh, let's trace this signal here and then this signal here, right? It allows you to more intentionally build your, your system up and more carefully debug it whether it's working or not. What else? I definitely want to encourage you, if you haven't been working on this, to get going. This is, this is a very significant 
a project that takes quite a bit of time, more than, than the previous uh, projects. And so if you're not allocating time towards it now, you're not going to be able to complete it in a timely manner. I don't want to see that happen. Um, so each class day between now and the end of the semester, that, that will be a question that I'm, I'm ready to answer questions that you have in addition to coming to my class for office hours and so forth. All right, so Wednesday we were talking about GPUs. Um, and we said these are kind of like a SIMD architecture because we've got these um, cores that look kind of like this, where we've got some core and we've got a very wide array, wide number of ALUs. Um, and so when we set a, a bunch of uh, instructions, all of these ALUs can be executing at the same time. We said typically that here there are 16 ALUs in a single um, GPU core. And that what the um, programming language that NVIDIA uses, CUDA, uh, does is that it groups 32 of these instructions together. 32 elements, I should say, not instructions. So it will, it, it takes your loop and your loop is supposed to execute, let's say your loop is supposed to execute over 1,024 elements. That's 2 to the 10th, right? It's going to divide that by 32 elements. And, and it's going to dedicate each one of those to a thread that's going to run on these GPU cores. So in this case, that's two to the fifth threads. Right. And so when one thread is executing on this core right here, the first 16 elements are going to pass through here in one clock cycle. Then the next 16 elements are going to pass through here in the second clock cycle. So we said this is how it's going to happen. And then we're just going to replicate these cores multiple times. And that's how we get a lot of processing power on the GPU. Okay. So on this GPU core, it looks like a SIMD architecture because all these ALUs are doing the exact same instruction. They're just working on a different element. On this course, the same way. We have a GPU, 16 elements processing here, the same instruction, but on 32 different threads. 32 different elements, excuse me. So, Inside of this GPU, it looks kind of like uh, a SIMD-ish setup. And inside here, it's like a SIMD-ish setup. But we've got multiple of these going on. And we're dedicating threads to here and some threads to here. So the instructions that are executing on this core are not the same instructions that are executing on this core right here. Uh, we, we might be in different parts of the loop, working on different parts of our, our algorithm, and, and so forth. So overall, it looks very much like a, a MIMD setup, because we've got one set of instructions here, we've got another set of instructions right here, and they don't co um, cooperate tightly between these different cores, as far as what instruction is executing at any given time. The program counter for the thread on this GPU core is probably not the program counter that's on the GPU for this core right here. Okay. 
Um, so that is why this kind of combination of these two kind of types of execution is what led NVIDIA to call this SIMT. So um, single instruction, multiple threads. I'm running one thread on here, I'm running some other thread on here. Within that thread, I've got the single instruction executing across multiple uh, ALUs. Within this thread, I've got the same instruction executing on that thread. But my threads have that loosely defined connection between, between the two of them. And so that's why they came up with this kind of uh, uh, acronym to try to differentiate it from being strictly SIMD, but also realizing that it's not completely MIMD either. It's kind of some connection between those two uh, ways of thinking about parallel processing. Does that make sense? All right. The um, the last thing I want to talk about, um, as far as like a um, an acronym, a way of approaching parallel processing, uh, is is this acronym, um, and this is. Uh, a way that a lot of parallel programs work. You'll notice it looks a lot like single instruction multiple data, but we've changed the I to a, a P. So what this P stands for is program. Theoretically, if we were to build a, a MIMD uh, parallel program, you could have one machine running program A, and you could have another run program B, and another run program C, and so on through our architecture. Maybe that's because you're doing something that's what's called task parallel, where each processor is performing a different task. And so you're going to write the, the program for that task dedicated to that processor. Um, and, and so you truly are running completely separate instructions for the task that is collecting data from the task that is processing data from the task that is displaying the data to the, the task that is storing the data, right? You can, you can conceive of that type of uh, parallel program. Um, but what SPMD says is, we're going to likely run on this type of a machine here, but it is too much work to have a bunch of dedicated programs for each processor in my system. That is too time consuming, and it, if one of them breaks, how do I know which one breaks and, and fixing it? So instead, I'm going to actually run the exact same program, the exact same executable on each one of these processors right here. This right here is now an SPMD setup. Now that doesn't mean that it's where this processor is executing is at the same point in code as this processor. You might have code that says something like, if my um, ID equals zero, then you do some critical code right in here. Um, else, do something else. So this might be process zero right here. And so then this machine said, oh, I'm supposed to do this code right here. 
and all these other ones will do something different. That is a way to do a, a SPMB um, program. And then this is oftentimes called, um, well, people are trying to move away from this terminology because it can be seen pretty offensively, but like a master-slave model where this process, processor, tells all of these processors what to, to do. Um, uh, so now it's, what is the new name that I'm trying to do? Um, worker manager or something like that. I know in the parallel computing we use the hub and spoke, kind of like a okay, like a central like a coordinator. Central and yeah, then, and then like spokes coming off. Yeah, 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 that works too. Um, <coughs> uh, so that's one way that you could construct a SPMD. Um, but more often, the way it works is that they're all doing the same types of tasks. But maybe there's some edge cases. So uh, as an example, let's say you've got, um, let's say you're doing some image processing to make it really simple. Okay, but you could do the same thing if you're simulating a, a universe or something like this. Okay, let's say you're doing a blurring op operation. Do you guys know how to do a blur? How do you do the blur? You just along borders, you do like average or something. Not just along borders. Um, across the whole image. Yeah, it's across the whole image, right? So if this is the pixel that you're uh, examining, what you can do, you can do a four point blur where you look at your four neighbors right here. So if this is um, X sub, I'll just call it P for picture, picture sub I sub J, you're going to set the, the new value of that equal to um, I minus 1 um, I plus 1 and uh, J minus one and J plus one. So that's above, below, left, and right, plus yourself. And then you just take that and divide by five, right? So you average those four things. Okay. So that's a way that you can blur a uh, a picture. All right. Well, if we consider now our image right here, and we're considering this pixel right here on the edge. You can't do this operation anymore, right? Because there is no pixel above it to consider. So um, you, you have the same thing on each edge, right? You can't look at the left pixel. You can't look at the right pixel. You can't look at the bottom pixel here. And then in the worst case are the, the corners, right? You can't look above and to the left, um, and so on. You could also do an eight-point pixel if you consider diagonals too. That's that's equally valid, and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. So in order to write this image smoothing or image blurring operation, you're going to have to have some if statements that consider. Are you at the top of the picture? Are you at the left of the picture, the right picture, the bottom of the picture, or any of these corner elements? Because you're going to 
not include all of those elements, and you're going to divide by a different number of, of neighbors. Right. Now, an easy way to take this picture is to divide it up into segments like this. So you can have processor 0 work here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on through our picture. If you do that, processor 0 is going to do different amount of work because it has two edges from processor 5, which doesn't have any edges. Right. Processor 2 only has one edge, and so forth. So, you, but you can write that in a single program, where you loop through all the array elements that belong to you, and you check in that moment, is the element that I'm doing on one of the four edges, of process it appropriately. So, is processor 0 here doing something different from processor 5? Technically, yes. But, pretty much, no. If you take those if conditionals, they're doing the same operation. They're blurring their pixels that belong to them, just like every other processor. It's just the fine details of how we blur along these edges is different than how we blur in the middle, right here. So in that case, do we want to write a whole separate program for process 0, separate from process 5 here? That seems like a lot of extra work, and it's a, it's a recipe for copy and paste errors. It's a, it's a recipe for missing some special case more easily than if we just have one program where we just consider those cases inside it. So most of the time, when you're talking about big parallel programs, people will, will use this. It's not required, but it's just easier to write one program to process different pieces of data on the different processors that are available to them. Okay, examples of this include um, MPI programs, which I do know that you've done in, in parallel programming, right? Where you <coughs> um, send messages back and forth between the processors. And so you need to know who are you getting your messages from, who are you sending your messages to, and so forth. All right? Questions about that? Hopefully that's straightforward. I just want you to know about this, these two acronyms, because they're not part of Floyd's classification of parallel programs, but if you're going to be doing G GPU programming, you're going to see this, and um, you might see this if you're just doing parallel processing, because it's the easiest way to write a parallel program um, to, to get it started. Last thing I want to talk about from your textbook um, is a way to kind of think about the kind of performance that you should expect out of a particular um, processor. Um, your, your authors call it the rook line model. Okay. Um, and what it's trying to do is to understand the difference between what uh, you might call as memory bound or CPU bound programs. Okay. For any program that you're going to run, there is going to be some bottleneck in the system that prevents it from running more quickly. And usually, it is one of these two systems in your uh, processor. Either the memory subsystem cannot get enough data to process quickly enough, or the CPU has a limit on how many elements it can compute at any given time. Um, and this is 
a very architecturally dependent uh, value. So if I take one program and I run it on my laptop, it might end up being CPU bound because my laptop has enough memory capability to handle that program. When I foolishly decide to run it on my phone and the, the fault, even though the phone has an inferior CPU, it also has an inferior memory system. And so I'm, I'm not even able to uh, process that same amount of data um, quickly enough and it becomes memory bound. Or vice versa. There's all kinds of reasons why you might want to do. So with the roofline model, what the idea is, is we want to look at uh, what's called the arithmetic intensity. of an algorithm. In other words, we want to compare how many CPU operations it requires to the number of memory operations that it requires. Okay. So, so we're comparing CPU versus memory so let's um, let's look at our bog standard um, summation. through an array of values and we're just adding them all up into a sum. In this example right here, for each iteration of the loop, how many memory operations are we doing? We have to read some, and then we have to, to write the sum. But I want you to think about being a smart compiler here now. Where is the compiler going to locate i and n and sum in the memory hierarchy? No. Too slow. It's going to put them in registers, right? We don't, we're not even going to allocate a space in memory for those values. After we're done with i in this loop, we're going to forget about it. Right? So there's no sense in storing it even in memory. We'll initialize it to zero, some register to zero, and say that register represents i. And then we can increment it throughout this loop. And when we're done with this loop, we're not going to store the value of i back to some memory location, right? We're just going to overwrite that register with some new value that we need later. The same is true for, as written here, for n and sum. Even if we're going to store sum into some memory location, do, I don't know, we'll, you know x, star x equals sum. A good compiler isn't going to store 
each intermediate value of sum into this memory location here. A good compiler is going to do all the intermediate additions in the register and then store that final value into the, the memory location. All right? So the only memory value that actually exists in this code right here is a sub i. We can't get around that, right? And to make this any sort of a meaningful example. a sub i is going to be large enough that it actually does have to go from memory through the cache and so forth. So in this case, inside the loop, we're doing one arithmetic operation of sum and one memory operation, a lookup of a sub i. Okay, so we would call this a linear um, arithmetic intensity because the, the proportion of CPU ops to memory ops is approximately one to one. So incrementing i doesn't count as a CPU up. <coughs> um, it still is proportional. Um, so, so it's proportional to the number of elements we execute, right? What, m what is more realistic, maybe, is that in here we do a lot of. CPU operations. If we're doing something like, say, like an FFT, where we have to do a bunch of complex arithmetic for each element in, in our array, that would increase our arithmetic intensity. Um, or we may have to bring a lot of values in to our uh, memory, if I wouldn't have erased the image processing one, that one would do a lot of loads, right? We did, we did five memory accesses um, and, um, and we only computed one new value, right? So what this intensity, this air, um, arithmetic intensity is some sort of continuum. Your book draws something like this, where over here is CPU intense, and over here is memory intense. And every algorithm that you run on your processor is somewhere in this continuum, where it does more work, less memory, or more memory, less work. <clears throat> All right. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the fundamental capability of the, the processor that we're going to execute this on. Okay, so what we're going to do is right here, this axis is the arithmetic equivalent of the arithmetic intensity. Alright? More CPU bound here, more memory bound here. Alright? And the y-axis is going to be The actual computation, how many, uh, well, gigaflops, I should say. Gigaflops per second is nonsensical, because there's already a perf in here. What does gigaflops stand for? Giga means? Thousand. No, that'd be kilo. Million. Billion. 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 With a B 
megaflops would be million, right? Yeah. So this is billion. Flop is floating point operations per second. Okay. So that's the most intense CPU uh, operation that you encounter. So giga floating point operations per second is what that uh, represents. Okay. So what we can do is we can actually look at our CPU, um, and there, and we can say, okay, it has this many functional units, and we know the clock speed, and so we know there is some sort of upper limit here that is impossible for that processor to exceed. This is the uh, maximum. Uh, CPU throughput. Okay? We, we know that we can't exceed that because that's where, what the machine was built to do. This is assuming that we never have a cache miss. It assumes that we don't have any uh, bubbles in our pipeline. It assumes that our branch predictor is always correct. It assumes that, that everything is working perfectly for us. You, you can look up for every processor that you own what this maximum rate is. Okay, And if you get far enough over here on your arithmetic intensity, you're not using very much memory, you should expect to be able to, to, to meet that maximum throughput right there. Because those issues that I talked about, are, you're not going to run in, into. But over here, on, on this side, where we're not doing a lot of CPU operations, we're doing a lot of memory operations, um, instead we need to take into account a, a different Okay, so we know we have memory connection to our processor, and your vendor will say it's got this big of a uh, I/O bandwidth between the memory and this uh, in the CPU, and so you can get this many amounts of, of, of bytes through the system at any given time. Uh, you might also run what your, your authors mentioned. It's often difficult to what, find out what the true maximum bandwidth is because most memory is difficult to actually reach this, reach this maximum. So you might want to map this with what the practical maximum actually is. And you can do this by running the stream benchmark. And the stream benchmark is a small program that's specifically designed to tax the memory system and try to get as much throughput through the memory system as possible and then be able to measure the performance of the memory system. So the nice thing about this is it says, well, I know that your vendor said that it can send this many bytes from memory to the CPU, but that's so idealized, you're never going to reach that um, true maximum. Here's what you actually can get considering your caches and considering um, contention on different bus uh, uh, and, and so forth. Whereas this is actually reachable. This maximum CPU throughput is very reachable. If you write the, the um, well-formed CPU benchmark, you can hit this maximum C CPU throughput. You, it is almost impossible to write the maximum bandwidth maximum benchmark. 
because of the differences in how our memory system works compared to our, our CPU system. Okay? So every processor, you can measure this, you can measure this, and you can get this um, profile for that processor. So this blue profile might be for my Intel Core processor. Okay? Uh, maybe my GPU looks like something like that. Or my, um, let's do one that's a little bit more interesting here. Um, higher maximum. Like that. Okay? That might be a different AMD versus Intel processor or something like that. So one has a higher CPU maximum throughput, but it has a lower memory bandwidth maximum. Okay? And so then what you can do is you can take and you can plot on this graph your particular algorithm. And you can say, okay, my thing takes this much CPU operation. And then you should be able to go up here. And depending upon which processor you're running, you should be able to say, I should hope to get this much performance from my machine. Because it's CPU heavy, it's memory light, I should be at these maximum thresholds. And then you can measure your code and compare it true performance to this expected performance. And you can say, am I getting that performance? Is it close? Or is it way down here? I've got something that I can definitely improve to bump it up. Or am I already up at these levels? And it's doing the best that it can. It can also help you inform. Um, so, for instance, if we do something down here, it might tell us that this blue processor is a better processor for this type of an operation, because I'm going to get that kind of performance. But, you know, starting right here, it switches to the green processor. So you have to ask yourself, am I more likely to have an arithmetic intensity on this side, or this side can completely inform which type of processor that is going to better match your particular processor. The opposite, if you're coming to it from a computer architect perspective and someone says, I want to do a, a program that's over here, you know where you have to focus on. You need to get your memory bandwidth up to help them out. Or if they say they're over here, you know that you need to make sure that you have enough CPU bandwidth to make it work. So you can focus your, de your processor development specifically on the particular types of algorithms that are going to be run by your client, your co clientele, and, and meet their needs more appropriately. Right? So we can use this roof line module, um, model to compare processors and compare execution across processors. I would definitely look at your book because it has some nice uh, drawings of roofline models for specific uh, architectures um, rather than uh, generic lines like I've written on the board right here as part of chapter six. But does this layout make sense to begin with? Right? Perfect. All right. What we're going to do for the last little bit of the semester 
um, is we're going to look at some specialized architectures. The first architecture that I want to examine um, are FPGAs. Okay. You're smiling, Matt. I can see it even uh, behind your, your mask. Why are you smiling? I think I know the answer. Because I've used one of those. Because you've used one of those. Tell me what an FPGA is. Uh, field program operator. What, how is it different from the CPUs that we've looked at so far? It uses more, uh, it uses more gates than I think the pro a normal processor does. Okay. It's just like programmable logic. It's programmable logic. That's the P part, right? Yeah. Feel programmable. You can, when you receive the FPGA from the vendor, you can choose how it's going to behave. Um, so you're not program, you're not writing programs that execute on a fixed CPU. You're actually telling the CPU itself how to be configured, which is kind of mind blowing. And I'd like to try to get open up your understanding of how an FPGA works. Because I think like in digital logic where you, where you use these, you probably used it more from a how do we get an FPGA to do what we want to do. Today, when I, starting today and going into next week, what I want to do is how do you build an FPGA? How do you make an FPGA so people can use them the way that you want to do that? Okay. Right, so these are more for just prototyping, correct? Uh, because maybe initially that's how they worked. Sure. Uh, but the reality is that there are so many produced that um, unless you need to do a mass production of the product, um, it might make sense to actually put the FPGA into into use um, because. Uh, let's say you're building your next network card, okay, and you're not quite sure how to get the most performance out of it. Yeah, FPGA is a great way to prototype because you can change how the hardware um, acts, and you can say, oh, well, I'm going to connect it in this way, or I'm going to send this signal that that way, and so forth. And so it's wonderful for prototyping. It's also wonderful um, if you send the FPGA uh, out. Uh, as part of your finished product uh, for two reasons. Reason number one is that what you prototype is what your consumers get. There's always room if you prototype in an FPGA and then you move it to an ASIC, an application specific integrated circuit, that there's an error in translation between what you did for the FPGA and what you did for the, the ASIC. Um, and so if you just ship out your FPGA, you've eliminated that source of, of errors in your system. The other wonderful thing about sending an FPGA out is that because it's field programmable, you can have people update their system. So if you figure out that your FPGA would work better this way or that you, you had a bug in it still, you can update it. So if you've ever had to upload firmware to one of your devices, it's probably because they actually are running an FPGA in them. And so you can reprogram the FPGA to, to work better now because, um, because of that. Uh, so so that's, a one, that's a nice thing about having an FPGA in, in the wild that, that you're selling as part of your consumer. So maybe when they are first um, envisioned, people were thinking prototyping or um, custom chips that you weren't going to be producing very many. But because so many FPGAs, have been produced at this point, um, it's tempting to also keep it as part of your final production system. All right. FPGAs have um, some, some really cool benefits. Um, one of the research groups that I worked with at Northwestern had a um, idea that modern processor and I um, would be configured as a uh, CPU um, connected to an FPGA. 
and that you would build these systems intentionally this way. Um, and then what you would do is you would run your normal everyday stuff on the CPU, but if you had something that you really cared about performance, you would program the FPGA in that moment to do that particular high performance thing. Um, and if you had really cool software, it would reprogram the FPGA during its execution. So it would run slow stuff in the CPU while it's reprogramming the FPGA to do the next fast thing, and then run that next th fast thing on the FPGA. Then come back to the CPU so it can do the slow thing while it's reprogramming the FPGA to the, the next fast thing. And they were actually a compiler team that was working on taking the just generic code that you wrote and identifying what parts of that code should be run on the CPU, what parts should be run on the FPGA, and how to write the, the code to dynamically allocate that code to the, the CPU and FPGA in, in interesting ways. All right. There's all kinds of ways that we can use FPGAs to get some performance. Uh, you can find this kind of a setup on some cloud providers, actually. They produce, provide you a CPU connected to an FPGA. Um, and you can do whatever you want with your, your FPGA. I don't know if that long term is going to win, because one of the alternatives that we're going to look at um, next are domain-specific processors. Things like um, neural net processors um, <coughs> or tensor processors or so, or so forth, which are also showing up in cloud providers as well. But we'll start here and then we'll move to those connections later. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Make sure you keep making progress on the project. It's, it, it's time intensive and, and so I don't want you to wait till the last minute and find out that you haven't left yourself enough time. All right? Have a great, great weekend, everyone. I'll see you on Monday.